Okay. <clears throat> Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. So um, I, I was fortunate or unfortunate, but fortunate enough to get sent as a diplomat to Kiev uh, for four days in 2012. And uh, I checked it, I arrived late in the evening, checked into my hotel, got up, had breakfast, and then, and it was a Sunday, and I said, what the heck am I gonna do today? And I got out my computer and I found that there was a free tour of Kiev starting um, right here in um, Independence Square. And I had 10 minutes to get there. My hotel was up over here and I shot down there and managed to join the tour before it started. And it was run by a student uh, from the sort of students union. And she did an absolutely wonderful job. So you're gonna get now a very quick tour. Well, it's gonna take half an hour, but I'm gonna go through a lot of photos um, showing you where she took us. So to start with, this is Independence Square. And Independence Square with the monument there celebrates the independence of Ukraine from the Soviet Union that happened in 1991. And the statue you see there was erected in celebration and finished 10 years later, 2001. So the idea of this is to show you some of the historic buildings, but also we'll take a look at some of the um, more classical architecture, residential or shopping areas. And frankly, it's, it's a, a beautiful city, uh, somewhat like the Paris of the East. It's an old city. Its founding uh, was um, around about the year 900 and became a classical city. And as has been commented, at the same time, Moscow was just a, a bunch of mud huts. So it's much older than Moscow. So here we go. So to give you some idea, here's a map of the central Kiev, and I'll just illustrate where I'm gonna go. Here's Independence Square. I'm then going to go over to these two squares here, Sophia Square and uh, St. Michael's Square. And they're joined by a road, which you can see uh, from one end to the other. So this one is exposed to the sun in the morning and this one more in the evening. We're then going to go up uh, to St. Mike, St. Andrew's Church up here. We're going to take a side trip uh, to a park there. And um, then I went on, I, I had such a wonderful time, I did a second tour that looked at the more modern Kiev. So we went up to this, um, what I'll show you, Friendship Arch. We went to some government buildings around here and to some parks along here. So just to give you some idea how, um, oh, this is probably um, half a mile. So it, it's, this is a fairly small area. So here's um, most of the pictures I took myself. Uh, the weather wasn't brilliant, but I, some sun did come out. So, uh, and I've got a couple of commercial ones. The first one was obviously commercial. So here's Independence Square with the Independence Monument. And there it is a bit later in the day as a thunderstorm sort of approached. The, the column uh, has the figure of a woman at the top. I, um, I don't speak the language, but uh, Berehina uh, with a, a rose branch in her arms. Here's um, one corner of Central Square. It's, it's the center for all social activity and also the center of all the protests that occurred in 2014 at the like. 
but very nice architecture. But uh, as you see, there are billboards there in addition to some really classic buildings. This is a monument to the founders of the city. Um, uh, as I said, around 800, 900 uh, uh, AD. It looks like a pretty fierce uh, Viking coming in there. I'm not sure where they came from. This is um, uh, St. Michael's Gate. This is a reproduction of one of the old gates of the city. This is a commercial picture because I didn't have a picture actually of that. And on the top of this uh, gate, you will see the Archangel Michael and he is the patron saint of the city of Kiev. Now, uh, one thing uh, needs to be pointed out, probably some of you already know, it was typically uh, written and, and pronounced Kiev, and it turns out that Kiev is the Russian uh, spelling and pronunciation, and Kiev is the Ukrainian pronunciation. Uh, when uh, the, Virtually all the people in Ukraine do speak Russian. Uh, for some, it's a, the, their primary language. And um, uh, oh, since the invasion, virtually all mentions of Kiev, K-I-E-V, have disappeared uh, from sites like Wikipedia, and you get sh shuttled to Kiev. Okay, this is uh, St. Sophia's Cathedral, and it was one of those two cathedrals uh, I showed you that are about half a mile apart with this road between them. Um, St. Sophia's is not an active church. Uh, it, um, it was built in the uh, Baroque uh, style, and it's now a museum of history and architecture and was the first UNESCO World Heritage Site in Ukraine. I didn't have time to go into any of these buildings. Um, I took the whole Sunday with tours, and then afterwards, I, for the next three days, I was working. There it, there it is um, later in the day, and you can see these gold uh, uh, cupolas on the top. This is at the other end of the, that uh, stretch with two cathedrals. This is the, uh, the, the north uh, east area, and this is Mikhailov uh, Square or St. Michael's Square. And this here is St. Michael's uh, Domed Monastery. I'll give you a little bit about that later. This is a commercial picture, but it was a rather pretty one. Um, this is the Diplomatic Academy, and this is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so I paid particular attention to that one as I was there as a, a U.S. diplomat. Here's uh, closer now to St. Sophia's Cathedral, looking down this road, connecting the two, going up to St. Michael's. And there are many, many statues you will find in Kiev de depicting their history and some a bit more whimsical. So this, this statue is actually to a leader of the Cossacks uh, following the defeat of the Polish army in 1648. But the, uh, the statue was erected almost uh, 250 years later. So the, the date on here is the date the monument was built. There's a view up that street towards the, uh, the domed monastery. Here is a, a more of a close up of the foreign ministry. And in front of this, you will see some statues and I'll have a couple of pictures of those. This is the Princess Olga monument. And the reason is for this is she is credited with spreading Christianity uh, through Rus, which is the name of the essentially the, the, con the countries of that are now Eastern Europe, um, which of course gives us the name Russia. And uh, 
uh, Olga is venerated as a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church because of uh, her work for Christianity. And right next to it, there are a couple of educators uh, who are also saints who were active about the same time. And there's the foreign ministry building more of a, a close up. So here is the, the monastery itself, uh, the monastery, and it has the, this imposing entrance. And then this is the more detailed part of the, or the more central part of the monastery. And as you go in, there are these frescoes on either side, and I'll say a little bit more about them. Well, this, uh, this is still a, a still, I don't know, still is the wrong word, but this is actually a functioning monastery. It was originally built in the middle of in the Middle Ages, but uh, it was destroyed during the 1930s uh, because there was um, a movement, uh, as you know, to get rid of religion, and it, well, there was arguments about the significance of this particular monastery. So it was actually destroyed and knocked down in 1935 to 36. And it was built again after the war. And um, so I was there in uh, 2012. It was probably completed. Well, as you see, it was opened in uh, 1999. And in 2018, it became the headquarters of the Orthodox Church of the Ukraine. This is what it looked like following its destruction in 1935 and 1936. And I took that picture obviously off the web. So another picture of the entrance of the cathedral. Um, a lot of gold, beautiful mosaics, paintings and decorations of various parts of the monastery. That's just a photograph I took later in the day. And here are some of the frescoes on either side. Uh, there you see one of um, the Archangel Michael representing the city of uh, Kiev. And here are the various members of the church. And there's another one on the other side. But this is an interesting one down the bottom because it, if I enlarge it, it actually uh, is a scene of Kiev at you know probably quite a, quite a long time ago when the monastery was originally built, and it shows the view from the Dnieper River, which I will show you later. There's an enlargement of part of the frescoes. Now at the side of that, there is this very striking monument. And this monument, and you see it's dated 1932 to 1933. And it is a monument to what they call the terror famine. And this was a man-made famine imposed by the Soviets, by Soviet Russia on Ukraine during collectivization. And the, the, the Russians insisted that the grain that was produced in Ukraine was shipped to Russia, leaving the actual residents of Ukraine who produced all this food uh, to starve. And there are, there are various pictures on the net of bodies lying all over the place and millions of Ukrainians were killed because of this starvation. And next to it is the story of this. And I, when I first saw this, I, this monument, I thought this must be a monument to um, those killed in the Second World War or something like that. No, this is a much bigger event for the Ukrainians, this uh, famine imposed on them by the Russians. And so it's not difficult to see why the Ukrainians hate the Russians. There's another picture within the monastery. And this is this rather simple building is uh, quite attractive. And this is the refectory 
which is essentially the dining hall of the, for the monks in the monastery. On the grounds, there is this rather nice uh, little structure, which actually is built over a, it's some call it a fountain. I think it's more of a spring of holy water uh, right on the grounds of the uh, cathedral, the monastery and cathedral. And here's the tour group I was in. This is a, a guide. Um, both the guides that we had spoke absolutely perfect English. And if you place a, a particular coin of the same size on one of these spigots, it actually sticks there. And I'm not quite sure why. Uh, I was probably told at the time. Um, Nearby is another famous church. This is St. Andrew's Church. And this one was built, as you see, 1747 to 1762 in the Baroque style. If you travel in Eastern Europe, Prague, Vienna, so many churches are in the Baroque style. And the difference is these has the, these typical Eastern European uh, type domes on the top. There's another close up of these domes. Another view of that church, um, along with some of the very pleasant um, residential buildings nearby. Uh, behind the church is a wooden structure that represents the first church that was built in the Ukraine around uh, 900 AD. There are many statues, as I've mentioned, to those who founded the city and defended it. And um, uh, here is one of these, as you see, the, the date there is 945 to 972. Nearby is a reconstruction of the Golden Gate of Kyiv, which was the main gate of the 11th century fortifications of the uh, city. It was constructed between 1017 and, and 1024, and it was named as an imitation to the Golden Gate of um, Constantinople. However, it was dismantled in the Middle Ages, so didn't exist for a long time, and was uh, rebuilt um, in uh, and opened in 1982. Uh, there's a side view of it. And I happened to be there in, during the Easter season. And so there was a lot of flowers and decorations and you'll see more of them as we go. And right next to it is another statue and uh, this is the Grand Prince of, whoops, the Grand Prince of uh, Kiev. As you see, I've, I still have some of the older spellings. Um, and uh, uh, he was the one who was arranged for the construction of uh, this, uh, this protected gate to the city. Uh, there are many, many parks in the city, and here is a rather whimsical uh, uh, artwork on one of the trees, and there's our guide who had just uh, taken us to see uh, this park. So um, here's a more whimsical statue. Uh, this actually is of characters in a Soviet uh, comedy movie called The Two Hairs. Um, other than that, I don't know anything about the movie, but a rather nice statue. Well, what do uh, Ukrainians do on a Sunday where it has started to warm up and it's the Easter season? So here in one of the parks, you will see a lot of the student age people. Uh, I see that blowing bubbles there is a <laughs> sort of occup favorite occupation for the individuals on the right. So um, here's some more pictures of the park. There are a lot of whimsical structures. 
and it's a favorite also of children. Children are very central to many of the activities that you find uh, in the city, particularly in these parks. A lot of these structures are for the children. And here are some of the spring decorations for sale at a stall right next to the park. Some more of the whimsical constructions, but um, some of the older kids, it's, here's a, it's, this is built as a slide for the young kids, but I see some of the older kids or uh, youth enjoy it as well. And then I'd like to show a few pictures of some of the buildings in this uh, area, which are really beautiful examples of architecture. And I hope that the Russians do not level the city because not only are there these beautiful churches, but the, the buildings themselves are absolutely gorgeous. So here's a few of the buildings. I'm pretty sure I took this one. This, this looks as if it was the old US embassy. The US embassy, when I was there, had moved to the suburbs to a much more modern building. Um, but they are all the, uh, the, the State Department is always very concerned about uh, barriers for uh, vehicles carrying bombs. So that's the reason for all these concrete boxes here. And this looks like a marine guard post, but this is now abandoned and they've moved to a much more secure building in the suburbs. On, on Sundays, they close the main streets near Independence Square, and these become pedestrian thoroughfares, and everybody comes out of their, their apartments and on a nice day goes for strolls. And these streets are lined on both sides uh, with shops. Uh, this is just a block or so from Independence Square. And it's a broad, really broad boulevard that uh, sets off many of these buildings and it's a wonderful place to go walking. And there you see a, a view in the other direction. Uh, here again is my tour group uh, with a guide explaining something. And I finished this tour maybe about two o'clock and had such a good time. I came back an hour later for a second tour uh, with a different guide. So this time we're going up. Here's Independence Square. We're going up here to, uh, which you'll, I'll show you some pictures, the Friendship Arch, the parks here and some of the government buildings around here. Here is a uh, Friendship Arch. This is not my photo. I was never far enough away to get it. This was built, as you might gather, from this traditional Soviet monument here to celebrate the, quote, friendship between the Russian and the Ukrainian peoples. There were plans in the early 2000s to knock the down. Uh, but instead they painted it uh, in the colors of a rainbow in the, um, around the 2016. However, after this, these current events, uh, I think you may see some dynamite placed under this arch and this statue. So here's right under the arch, and we have two things here. Uh, you can see that this is the the traditional Soviet monument of friendship. This is, I believe, a later one uh, depicting the history of Ukraine, particularly Kyiv. And the whole place is in, a, in amusement, in an amusement park uh, for the, the kids. So here's some more um, uh, uh, 
uh, scenes more close up. So this is the, the history of Kiev. And so you can see here's one, here's this figure who was around 900. So here's somebody representing the church. This is probably a more modern worker. Actually, this part looks does look Soviet. Um, but there's one of the, again, the old rulers of the city. Here's the statue itself of the, the Soviet statue. And right behind it is, I think, something like some Dodgem cars. And here, here is um, a, a, a rather small, I wouldn't call it a Ferris wheel, but something that zooms you around at speed, totally blocking the picture of the, uh, the back of the statue. Uh, if you go to the edge of that park, you get a view over the Dnieper River. And this is the more industrial section of uh, Kiev. And there you can see in the background some of the suburbs, so which is, um, and as, as you've probably seen from the, the war pictures, the suburbs are very different architecture from the old center of the city. Uh, here's an interesting statue on, or I wouldn't call it a statue, but a bit of artwork. And there you see a face with uh, this, this young woman just happened to be there when I took the photo. But if you now turn sideways, you see it's actually a giant frog. Um, uh, but there is an ornamentation. Nearby you, there is the Marinsky Palace. This is the official ceremonial residence of the president of Ukraine. When I was there, it was surrounded by this fence, and I believe it was undergoing some, yes, it was, it was undergoing some renovation. You can see the scaffolding here and here. But at this point, the student guide made it quite clear uh, that he and his fellow students uh, considered the government to be totally corrupt uh, at the time, and they had absolutely no faith in it, which led uh, a couple of years later to the revolution that uh, threw out the, the then president, who was funneling off a lot of money and was uh, also uh, sponsored by the uh, Russians. And uh, oh, and, and my wife is looking, says, I'm paying Paul Manafort. Yes, so that's the residence. Then we went through some of the uh, more modern uh, government buildings. This is the entitled the Building of Cabinet Ministers. So I presume it's a central office building of members of the government. This is the National Bank of the Ukraine. Uh, all these buildings have quite fancy ornamentation on them, which makes it very interesting. Uh, this one is called the Lieberman Mansion, and it is the Writers Union House. Unfortunately, I don't know what this building is. Uh, I had to find out what these buildings were by, by looking on uh, Google and Google has no idea what this building is, but very uh, heavily ornamented by cla with classical statues. Now, this is a, a very interesting building. This is called the House with Chimeras. And uh, Chimeras, in this case, means animal uh, sort of statues all over the building. I'll show you some more close-ups. This building was originally constructed by a Polish architect, whom I will not attempt to uh, pronounce, uh, as his own upmarket residence uh, in during the period 1901 to 1902. Um, by the time we get to the post-war period, it was occupied uh, by the communist 
party. Uh, after independence, uh, the, uh, the building was fully uh, restored according to the architect's original plan. And here's why it's absolutely weird. Oh, well, no, that, that won't show it entirely, but you can see these on the top. It's now uh, used as a presidential residence for official and diplomatic uh, ceremonies, and that's been since 2005. Now, here's the sort of ornamentation on it. Weird animals, figures, uh, whimsical, all over the place. And here you will see uh, rhinoceroses, mermaids, and various other figures. Okay, now continuing on a walk through the residential area, we come to a park that is a park that was absolutely central to the Easter egg, sort of part of Easter. And here's the first, this, this park, all the trees were decorated with Easter eggs. I'll show you a few pictures. There are the Easter eggs. Ukrainian Easter eggs are made before Easter and they take months to make. Each color is put on separately. Um, they, they cover it with wax and then remove the wax and dip it in a dye. And you get these very fancy uh, designs. So where have we been? This is sort of ending it up. We've done Independence Square. Um, we were down here I'm not, uh, where we had St. Sophia's Cathedral, St. Michael's Cathedral. We went uh, to St. Andrew's Church, the Golden Gate, came back to some of this shopping street, People's Friendship Arch, back to a park here, and that's where we finish. So here's my final picture, which is the guide for the second tour. And there just are not enough branches on the trees. So they start hanging their Easter eggs on a wire fence there. And I took that picture of our guide through the wire fence. So I hope that gives you some idea of what uh, Kiev is like in the Central Park when you see all these uh, pictures day after day now. Uh, from Ukraine. It's a gorgeous city and it is such a shame what's happening there, as I'm sure we all feel. Okay, there we are. And I am on time. Well done, Peter. Thank yeah, very you. nice. Thank you. It's a, it's a shame to see what's probably mostly gone now. Well, I don't think that there has been any damage yet to the center of Kiev. I think all the shelling appears to have been on apartment blocks on the, uh, on the edge. Obviously, the Russians intend uh, the way they're going to just lay waste to everything. Uh, but that's, that's what they're going to be attacking, what you just saw. I have a question for you, Peter. Uh, you said something about working in a diplomatic uh, uh, role. Could you give us a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, sure. I was um, assigned to the US Department of State as a science advisor for a year uh, between August 2011 and August 2012. And I was there uh, in based on my knowledge of biotech crops, one might wonder why the State Department has any interest in crops. And it's twofold. First of all, uh, cro uh, agricultural exports represent something like 50 billion a year to the US economy. And secondly, the State Department is very interested in food security around the world because 
if if countries are, fo are food secure, they are less likely to have revolutions and flows of immigrants out that destabilize the whole region. And as, so as part of my time there, uh, I was, uh, and actually a couple of years afterwards, when I was sort of a consultant, I, I got to go to 11 different countries, uh, lecturing uh, and mainly at universities, but also consulting with government officials um, and members of the scientific community. And on this trip, I was initially sent to the Czech Republic. Then I went to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and the Ukraine, and it's no longer the, and Ukraine. Uh, and uh, it, it was it was an education for me as well as uh, for what I was trying to explain uh, in the various countries. Now, uh, biotech crops are also known as GMOs, and uh, GMOs are officially prohibited in the Ukraine. But here's what happened at one meeting I had with. Uh, the Minister for Agriculture, and I gave her this little little 15 minute talk on the advantages of biotech crops. And a couple away from me, this was a small meeting, was a farmer, obviously a high tech farmer, and he began screaming at the minister. And I had a translator who was whispering in my ear, and she said, he's yelling at the minister he, and he's saying, you know, we're all growing these crops, these what I'll call now GMO crops. Why don't you make it legal? And the minister said, yes, yes, we know you farmers are all growing them, but we have to declare it to be illegal and that you're not growing them because that's what the people want. So there's the difference between official policy and what farmers actually do. If there's something that's an advantage to them, they'll typically find a way to grow them. So I hope that explains what I was doing. But And what one advantage was I traveled on a diplomatic passport. So it, it didn't make me much difference, but when I got back to the US particularly, I was able to go through the fast line for diplomats. <laughs> well, actually, you know, one of the, there's not only that, Peter, but you could have uh, broken numerous laws in, right. in the countries you're in and, and gotten away with it. it. So, uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I was, every country I went to, I was hosted by the embassy. And usually my visit would start off at the embassy where it was explain the situation in the country and that sort of thing. Only in two countries did I get to actually meet the ambassador. Normally I was a, a little flunky, got dealt with by flunkies. Just the same, what an extraordinary experience and thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yes. Let's give thank Peter you. a big uh, hand and a big thank you.